Today I'm really going to focus on cats. Um, and this, this topic was brought to me and somebody said, hey, can you talk about pneumonia? And specifically, can you talk about X, Y, and Z? And I said, sure. Um, but what I want to let you know is I'm going to kind of focus on particular areas um, where we've got some new information and some developing information around pneumonia in cats, specifically from shelter settings. Um, so that's going to be my focus. Um, other things to let you know, uh, I'm going to focus on some cases as well. Um, and at that point, I will turn the lights kind of up and down. I'll try not to give anybody a seizure because um, I do have some x-rays and things to review with you. So not to hit a bunch of veterinarians over the head with definitions, but just to make sure we're all on the same page with what we're talking about with pneumonia, we're really looking at an inflammatory response to an agent or a process. And so, although I'm going to focus on agents today, certainly the, probably one of the more common ones that we see and one of the first things that comes to mind is always aspiration pneumonia, right? Post-anesthetic aspiration pneumonia or something like that. I'm not going to focus on that specifically. I'm really looking at um, agents in this talk. Um, it's usually an exudation of cells and fluid into the lower airways. So that's really your definition of what pneumonia is. But when when it's in a shelter, often we're dealing with animals that are um, wrestling with various challenges, immune compromises, other infections. And so pneumonia is not just about the lungs. It often, in our patients, generalizes into multi-organ system failure and can often look like sepsis because that's exactly what it is. The lungs and the GI tract being the primary ways that um, bacterial agents can kind of enter into the bloodstream. Um, and so we're really looking at it as a disease that's the start of a downward spiral, and often a very quiet start to that downward spiral that we may or may not recognize early on. So it's funny, I pulled out some pathology textbooks. Is Jody here? She's lecturing after lunch. No, Jody Gurdon. Are you here yet? So Jody Gurdon's lecturing after lunch, and I refer to a paper of hers in here, and I stole some pictures from her with her permission. But she's the pathologist who'll be talking about um, forensic evidence of of starvation, and she actually is involved in some of the research I'm going to talk about. And when you talk to Jody about pneumonia or anything, it's a completely different viewpoint, um, vocabulary. Like a pathologist sees exactly that. That is what they're talking about. When I think about pneumonia, I think about the little kitten in the cage who having, is having trouble breathing. And so it's almost like talking two different languages at times. But as I pulled kind of, okay, how do we classify pneumonias? If I'm going to kind of split them up and try to be organized about this. And I found that it's a hot topic that pathologists argue about a lot, how to classify, you know, different sorts of pneumonia. And so there's various schemes, one being by agent. And that's kind of where I'm going to work from. So viral, bacterial, parasitic, or hypersensitivity reaction to some agent that may not be a primary agent, but instead how the body reacts to it. Um, sometimes they like to do it by exudate because they like really gross, thick, greasy stuff, right? So they're going to classify the pneumonia based on the stringy kind of material that they can pull out of those lungs as they look at them. So they talk about suppurative, um, which is more of your neutrophilic kind of exudate. They talk about fibrinous, which is when you've got fibrin and fibrous material starting to collect, so you get that thick kind of gooey um, material. And then pyogranulomatous, which is going to be more of your macrophage response. And why do we care? As veterinarians, we care because that may help us determine what agent is at play. For me, I look at that and say that helps me understand the process and what's actually causing this in my patient um, or what may cause it in my population. Because most of the time, if you've taken it to necropsy, and I will be focusing on some pathology today, you've done that because you're concerned about the rest of the animals that were around that patient. If you've lost that one, you don't want to lose any more in your shelter. And so that necropsy is more of a diagnostic tool for the rest of your population. You could talk about uh, pneumonias in terms of morphology. So where in the lung are they impacting? So you can talk about bronchopneumonia, which I spelled wrong. You can talk about interstitial. You can talk about embolic, or you can talk about granulomatous. And again, those relate to the agents because different agents are going to have different um, responses. You can talk about distribution. And this one takes you back to the first year of vet school, the very first radiograph they popped up for me to look at. And I didn't even know where in the animal we were. It's like this complete, utter panic, right? You, you just see the screen. There's ribs there, that should be pretty obvious. I had no idea what I was looking at. Like there's just a blank screen. So you kind of learn that distribution. Is it a focal? Is it a craniovantral pattern, a diffuse or a lobar pattern? 
Um, if you're into population medicine and epidemiology, you start talking about using terms like enzootic, contagious, or shipping fever, these kind of nebulous terms that we use to describe how they're acting in a population, which is very different from talking about how they are acting in a lung. Um, and then we've got fun names that are geographical based on where this sort of disease happens, and that those can be very colorful. I don't do... Um, I don't do a lot of large animal medicine. I don't really do any medicine in cows, um, but they have the best names, I think, for their sorts of pneumonia that they see. And then there's miscellaneous ways to adjectival descriptions. Often there's several names for a single disease, and that's part of the reason it gets controversial and confusing in trying to talk to people about what you're actually seeing. This is what I see. So upper respiratory infection primarily, not pneumonia, but certainly the concern is always, when does it become pneumonia? How am I gonna know that it's now pneumonia? And does it change how I'm treating this patient? So we see the cats with the clinical signs. And the fact is, is that move from upper respiratory into pneumonia and lower respiratory tract disease can be extremely subtle in cats. Particularly if we're keeping them in individual cages, um, our observations are kind of scattered or, or infrequent. Um, cats can huddle for all sorts of reasons. We may not notice that things have changed. The biggest thing is going to be respiratory pattern. Um, and so are they dysmic? Are they showing us a, a change in the respiratory pattern? Again, stress impacts that and our patients are often under stress. And it can be super subtle in a cat because really their whole goal is to keep us from knowing that they are feeling sicker than we would like them to be. They don't want us to know their weakness. Fever is not reliable, so just they may not have a fever. In fact, up to 50% of them may not have a fever, but they have pneumonia. So if you've used that as a marker for this is getting worse, it's not a reliable one. High fevers are more likely to go along with your viral infection than with pneumonia itself. Cough, also not reliable. Coughing cats, we have limited differentials, and I'm going to go through those in detail, so I won't, I won't get into that now. But we don't really expect to see a lot of cough. It can be quiet or absence, even if the cat has severe pneumonia. Tachycardia, usually this is a response to hypoxia. So their heart rate is up because they're not getting enough oxygen. Um, and again, also hard to distinguish from stress and other elements that may be playing a role. Our most valuable thing is our physical exam. Crackles and wheezes on auscultation. And Thoracic auscultation on a cat is a challenging thing. It's something that we have to do over and over and over again, and I try to teach it, and it's a challenging thing to teach. Their lungs are about this big. Your shelter's got all sorts of noises um, that are going on, and you're trying to move quickly through populations, but this is probably the most important thing, is that physical exam and the auscultation on that cat in a quiet room, using proper equipment, um, and kind of knowing what you're listening for. So I'm going to focus on four classes of agents today, and I will tell you I'm going to relatively breeze through bacterial and fungal. One, because bacterial, because there's not that much new to tell you, and I don't think I'm going to teach you much. Fungal, because we don't see it that often around here. Um, and so I'm going to remind you of some things in fungal, but I'm going to spend the vast majority of this talk on parasitic and protozoal pneumonia, because I think those, there might be some surprising things there um, for those of you working in shelters. So bacterial pneumonia, how does it get there? Inhaled or aspiration, but it can be hematogenous. You especially want to think about that for your kittens or your immunocompromised animals. That hematogenous is possible, but most of the time it's inhalation um, for the type that we're looking at versus aspiration. Most of the time it may follow the upper respiratory, um, the severe upper respiratory that you see. Um, typically, bacterial pneumonias are bronchopneumonias. So just to throw them with the pathology terms in there that I gave you, they're generally suppurative, so neutrophilic or fibrinous. Uh, they can be interstitial or lobar, but generally because they're inhaled, they're working from those larger airways down into smaller airways and into those airway walls. So that's kind of what you're seeing around that. Primarily what we're looking at is bacterial uh, pneumonia secondary to viral infections. And to take you back to block four, if you're a Cornell graduate, um, what you're really looking at is a virus that has now um, weakened the mucociliary clearance, um, predisposed that animal to the bacteria being able to track down and get into those lower airways. And so the viruses themselves, they alter colonization of the bacteria. All those little cilia that normally push everything up and keep it out of the lungs are compromised by the viral agents. And then the respiratory epithelium resistance patterns are lowered and the bacteria can invade. Agents in particular we think about for cats are most common agents, Bordetella, 
Um, I hope that doesn't surprise you, but yes, the cats can get dog kennel cough. Um, they're not immune to it, and in fact, they can be carriers of it as well, so don't forget that. You can vaccinate against it. We generally only recommend that in an outbreak scenario um, and not as a core vaccine in your shelter. But Bordetella can cause pneumonia in cats, and it causes coughing in cats. So for a coughing cat, that's on your list of differentials. Pasteurella, not surprising. Pasteurella seems to like to give everything pneumonia. It's the one thing I do remember about cows um, is Pasteurella so, and rabbits, right? So, and Pasteurella form those lovely fibrinous strips of disgustingness. Um, but Pasteurella, Bordetella, and then the others, Mycoplasma species, are most reported as your um, bacterial pathogens in cats. Age and immune status, your biggest risk factors, not surprising. Your old animals, your young animals, your immune compromised animals, your retroviral positives. Those are the ones that are going to be most likely to get bacterial pneumonia. So, how are we going to diagnose it? And this is specifically a shelter talk. So, you can find all sorts of research on that, on diagnosing this with CT um, and extensive sampling. We're not doing that in my shelter. I don't know about yours. Um, biggest diagnostic, not surprisingly, is physical exam, auscultation, and observation of that cat. So examining, listening. Um, if you have the ability to do blood work in your shelter, sending out a CBC may or may not help you. Inflammatory leukogram, sometimes you may have an increased white blood cell count, but you're not necessarily going to. You can also see neutropenia if things are kind of collecting in those airways and you have a real exudative pneumonia. You may actually be low on your neutrophils, not high. So a CBC is less valuable than you might think. Chemistry is going to be totally normal, so that's probably not going to help you at all unless your animal is in late stages of um, multi-system failure. Imaging is the best tool. So really, chest x-rays would be ideal here and may be absolutely necessary for a true diagnosis. The other thing to remember is airway cytology. If you're doing spay-neuter in your shelter, you have everything to do essentially a tracheal wash. And you may not have done one in a while or ever since vet school. Um, they can be frightening if you read the procedure. How many of you are doing tracheal washes? OK, just a handful. So they can seem frightening. But if you're really trying to rule out with a patient particularly an older patient, am I looking at pneumonia? Am I looking at cancer? Am I looking at some of the other reasons for pneumonia versus bacterial? Am I looking at an eosinophilic disease? Am I looking at a parasite? A tracheal wash can give you a lot of information, and it simply involves passing a clean, doesn't have to be sterile, but a new endotracheal tube, just like you would, cleanly, as possible as if you were going to do spay-neuter. You are obviously sedating them. Um, a short-acting sed sedative is probably the best idea, as long as the patient's otherwise up to that. You pass that tube, you send down a red rubber, you introduce five to seven cc's of sterile saline, um, and you send it in and immediately aspirate it back out. You get about half of your sample back if you're really lucky. Sometimes it's nice to have somebody kind of rolling the chest around a little bit. It sounds frightening, it is frightening. The first time you do it, you're thinking, I'm putting this fluid down the lungs, are you kidding me? I'm gonna drown this patient. Um, but you get good samples back and you can do cytology on that, treat it just like urine, do it right in your own little area, spin it down, look under a microscope, or send it out. You can do culture and sensitivity on it. And that can really help you start to clarify what am I looking at, um, particularly in a non-responder. And I don't think it's out of the question for some shelter practices to do that. Um, I would still encourage you to get chest rads. If you have x-ray on site, that's great. We don't. If you can send to a local practitioner, that's great. Um, I like to tell stories, a quick aside, when I was, I was in a very small shelter in Baltimore um, before I came back here, and we had a local practitioner who, whenever he euthanized a patient, would donate $25 to the imaging fund for the shelter. And so he did our imaging for us, and I never paid for an x-ray because it was part of his memorial program, um, which I loved. I know not everybody does things like that, um, but I thought it was a really, it was like the thing I didn't have in trying to put the pieces together, because, you know, setting up an x-ray is not cheap. Um, but it, wasn't a, it gave a lot of my animals a chance. Um, who otherwise may not have been able to get those diagnostics. We were broke, and that was really the only way I was able to help those animals. So with bacterial pneumonia, treatment is best based on culture and sensitivity, which does mean collecting airway samples. Um, I wouldn't do it on every animal. We certainly aren't. Um, but if they're non-responders, then it's probably worthwhile looking um, and getting a tracheal wash sample. If you're going to treat empirically, there are, better, there are antibiotics that are better than others. So you need to one have, have one that can really penetrate those secretions. Remember, it's an exudative disease into the lower airways in these tiny little spaces. And so you want something that's going to kind of get through those layers. TMS is not a bad choice. I don't use it very often. Clindamycin 
is a good one to remember, and I'll come back to it as I get to the other sections. Doxycycline, of course, is what most of us are using, and it is good for lower airway disease as much as upper airway. Remember, Bordetella and Mycoplasma were on those lists, and they are susceptible to doxy. Fluoroquinolone, certainly. Most people will reach for Batril um, in these scenarios, and that's good. Your penicillins do not have good availability um, to those airways, but your beta-lactams will. So Clavamox is an empirical choice, which is often people's empirical choice, um, not necessarily in the shelter, but for pneumonia in general. And you want to treat one week beyond clinical illness. That's not necessarily one week beyond the change in x-rays. And I'm going to show you some radiographs, and we'll talk about that. It's one week beyond clinical illness, however you have defined it in that animal, whether it's auscultation or a breath pattern or anything like that. Question? What's that called? Azithromycin. Azithromycin, yes. Um, Azithromycin is not a bad choice either. There's not as much research on it, but certainly it should cover anything that Clavamox would be good at. I would expect that azithromycin would be fine. Prognosis. Uncomplicated pneumonias, good prognosis. So uncomplicated, it's a patient with a uh, otherwise healthy signalment, um, not a lot of compromise, you should be good. With added risk factors, age, immune status, retroviral status, um, other issues going on, it's a worse prognosis that needs longer treatment. And honestly, for these, I always feel like it's that wider patient assessment, which is what I'll finish with today, in looking at what standard of care do these patients need to do well and recover, and do, are we able to offer that standard of care in this shelter or through the shelter system somehow? So this guy, still eating, licking the spoon. This guy has pneumonia, looks to be in good body condition from what I can tell. Maybe he's just fluffy. But I suspect he's, you know, a little plump there with his food. He's got a pretty good prognosis even with pneumonia. This kitten, I start to worry a little bit. Skinny, scrawny kitten, upper respiratory progressing to pneumonia, I worry. And I'll talk a little bit more why as we get to some other agents. And this older kitty, if this kitty's got pneumonia, there's always a concern that there's something else underlying, could be neoplasia, et cetera. Prognosis is certainly guarded for that cat. Not to say we're not going to treat it, it's just that it's a little bit more guarded and we want to make sure that we really have a full picture of what's going on and that we've got the right diagnosis if we're going to commit to that, level, that length of time. Fair? Okay. And I pulled this, I really love this quote because I, in, because I was trying to come up with a way to say it, and this guy says it a lot better than I could. Bacterial pneumonia should be viewed as a complication of another underlying disease. Therefore, patients should be rigorously evaluated for risk factors if such, risk, such factors are not immediately apparent. Because an otherwise healthy animal with an upper respiratory should have enough mechanisms and support to kind of clear that and not have it progress. An otherwise healthy animal should be able to fight off that pneumonia without it becoming severely compromised. And so if I'm worried about pneumonia, I generally am thinking to myself, what else is going on here? And sometimes it's obvious. Sometimes it's obvious it's this kitten in the middle, right? And we know exactly what the risk factors are and why this kitten may be compromised or this older cat. Sometimes it's obvious. But if it's not obvious, we need to really investigate a little bit further. Because it's not just us asking the shelter to commit resources or the staff to commit resources. We're asking that cat to commit to weeks and weeks of treatment. Um, and, and, and in some cases, some pretty severe anorexia, lethargy, and discomfort. And so if we're going to ask them to, co to commit to that, we want to really have a sense that we're doing the right thing for them, I think, in the long run. All right. That's the end of bacterial pneumonia. Any questions at this point? Because I really did kind of gloss through that. Because there's sexier stuff coming, and I much rather get to the sexier stuff. All right. Fungal pneumonia, I am really breezing through. For one, because we don't see it very often around here. Um, so it's another one, though, where if you've got cases of fungal pneumonia, you want to be thinking about why, especially in a cat. So generally, the mechanisms for fungal pneumonia is you have to get a high dose exposure. For dogs, they stick their nose right in there. For a cat, they're right at the ground level of some kind of fungus that they've, in, that they've inhaled. Or they're an immunosuppressed cat. They're on chemotherapy. They have retroviruses, something like that. Um, you can get fungal pneumonia either through the air or hematogenously through blood. It's a cell-mediated disease, so to reference you back to your pathology again, while the bacterial pneumonia is primarily neutrophilic, the granulomatous, the fungal pneumonias are primarily granulomatous, so you're looking at a macrophage response, and it's different that way. It tends to be more nodular um, in the lungs, and it tends to have additional sequelae, like pleural effusion, um, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and um, PTE, pulmonary thromboembolism. And so there are elements where it progresses pretty quickly, and you will find evidence on chest taps and that sort of thing. 
but generally you're going to suspect it because you're in an area that has fungal disease. And our transport of cats cross country doesn't tend to be all that frequent. If, we, if I did decide to talk about dogs, I probably would spend more time on this because as we transport dogs, this is actually becoming more of a concern for us in regions where we don't generally think of fungus. Um, Cryptococcus is the most widespread fungus, and we do see that. We see that in New York City. Do I have some people here who's treated cases of Cryptococcus? No? Okay. Um, but that is more, that's the most widespread, most common fungal disease in cats. It tends to be that Roman nose, if you're remembering back to school, um, Roman nose presentation. Aspergillosis can certainly occur in cats as an aspergillosis pneumonia. They tend to be immunosuppressed cats um, because aspergillosis is everywhere. That's something we do have around us. Um, but you generally have to be immunosuppressed to see that. Histoplasmosis is one of the ones that you see pockets in Texas, Oklahoma, and California. Um, I've never seen a case of histo in a cat. Um, I did have a couple cases with dogs come through when I was in Maryland. Blastomycosis is another one, Mississippi River Valley. That's another thing. I tend to think of dogs, but cats can get it. Um, and then certainly coccidioides. Most of these fungal diseases, if they're pneumonia, they're also showing up in other places like skin lesions. So it's not just about the pneumonia. It's about a multisystemic um, infection with fungal pneumonia. And the prognosis for them are pretty frightening. Um, so you're talking about long-term treatment, you're talking about some pretty severe treatments, um, and again, not something that we commonly see here, and since I didn't have a lot of hands go up, anybody treated fungal pneumonia in a cat in their shelter? All right, this is why I only decided to have two slides on it, but I figured I had to pay attention to it and at least acknowledge it exists. All right, now you ready to go on to the sexy stuff that you probably have seen? Okay, good. Let's talk about parasitic or verminous pneumonia, which is my favorite. Um, this, I pulled this um, off the internet as I was just looking for some pictures and things. This was an article that came out of the UK. Pet owners panic as lungworm attacks cats and dogs in the soggy summer. <laughs> um, any idea why soggy summer would matter? Sn snails. I gave you a hint up there. Snails. All right. So part of the life cycle of the lungworm involves the snail. And since they had a particularly wet summer, they had a lot of snails and then they had a lot of lungworm. But there was something about the way this was written. I immediately sent it to Jody because I thought she'd be here. And I was like, do you like this? And she, we just both pictured like lungworms chasing cats and dogs all over the UK, right? Totally panicking as the lungworm attacks. And so this was the picture they had on high alert. Cats and dogs are in danger of lungworm, a parasite they can pick up from slugs and snails by eating them. Um, high alert. So guard your dogs and cats. Don't let them eat your snails. So to remind you of the life cycle. I'm talking about Lurostrongulus primarily because that's the one um, that we see and because truly if you treat that one you pretty much get the other ones too. They're not as common. So the cat is the definitive host of the feline lungworm. The eggs hatch, the mature worms are in the lungs and then they hatch eggs in the lungs. The cat coughs, thus coughing cat, lungworm should be at the top of your differential, particularly if you're in this region. So my local vets, lungworm is the first thing I put. Um, they cough them up, they swallow them, and then they're delivered out in feces. The snails and the slugs eat the larvae that are out in the feces, and then the cat comes along, or the rodents, eat the snails and the slugs, and then eventually the cat eats rodents, reptiles, snails, or slugs, and then they get the lungworm back, okay? Larvae are ingested and migrate from the intestines into the lungs and mature, so they travel from the intestines into the lungs, causing all sorts of damage. Pre-patent period is about four to six weeks. So from the time that they eat to the time that they are pooping out is about four to six weeks. Clinical signs can be absolutely nothing. So they may be completely aclinical. The next biggest one is coughing. And they do cough. They sound like people or dogs coughing. Um, your highest differentials are obviously going to be allergic bronchitis or a hairball. And I can't tell you how many times in the shelter we'll be like, that cat's coughing. We'll watch it for like a day to see if it coughs up a hairball. If it doesn't, it's lungworm. That's kind of how our minds work. Um, th and they can be severe. I'm going to show you some pictures of the damage these lungworms can cause. They can cause pulmonary hemorrhage. They can cause abscess formation, pleuritis, and pyothorax. All of those can be sequela of severe lungworm infections. So it's not really funny. Um, but the snails and slugs are kind of cute. And the high alert made me laugh. How many people, how many vets do you have in the room that went to Cornell for vet school? How many of you had Marjorie from Jillo? for parasitology. Okay, a couple of hands still up. I will never forget, ever, ever. So she was a parasitologist and we would go in there for poop lab and we'd spin all the poop down, we'd look under microscopes and she stood about this tall, she had this very high voice and she was just lovely. Like nothing excited her as much as looking at poop under a microscope. 
And I will never forget when I got the sample with the lungworm larva in it. And she stood there and she's like, look at the kink in the tail of the lungworm. Do you see the kink in the tail? Do you see the kink in the tail? And I was, you know, I'm a vet student. I'm like, I am never going to look at larva and look for kinks and tails of lungworm. Here we are, right? Never say never. So they've got these lovely little kinks in the tail and that's how you know it's a lungworm larva. And you can, I tried to make it so you could see it to make her proud because she retired. You can see that little kinky tail right at the end. That is what signals that this is indeed a lungworm larva. So larva one comes out in feces. They will also be coughed up um, when you're getting, if you're getting tracheal wash samples and you will see the larva in the lung samples. So in your tracheal wash, they'll be swimming around. You'll note the kink in the tail and you'll say, oh my God, that's exactly what she was talking about. There it is, okay? So um, our local shelter here in Tompkins County, we had 24 confirmed cases of lungworm last year out of, out of uh, that 1,013 cats. And I re really only surveyed the cats, that's cats over eight weeks of age, because younger than that, it'd be really surprising. Remember prepatent period being six weeks, you get it by eating things. I just pulled cats older than eight weeks. I probably could have gone cats older than 12. Um, but 24 cases locally. Uh, our local lab, D Dwight Bowman's lab, collects fecal samples from a lot of our shelters, including probably many of the ones where you work. And it is a non-random shelter sampling. It's whatever poop the shelter sends in. So it may be clinical or aclinical animals. They don't necessarily track that data. But 6.2% of the cat fecal samples that were sent into their lab were positive for lungworm. It was higher than almost every other parasite other than Toxocara. So they're pretty, they're pretty common. This was also through a fecal float method. So truly, if you want to find lungworm larvae, you should be doing a Behrman's. But even in their lab, they weren't doing Behrman's. They found these on fecal floats, and you will find them on fecal floats. The pathology is not mild. It is actually pretty severe. So as the larva migrate, I'm hoping that helps your picture be a little bit clearer, they will form eosinophils kind of flood the area and then they form a nodular sort of um, appearance. Those nodules can be up to 10 millimeters in diameter, so they're not small. Um, and they will actually live in the terminal bronchioles. So you'll have the larvae that are actually sitting in those terminal bronchioles. And thus, that's the reason why as they're kind of living in the terminal bronchioles, as the nodules start to form, you actually have a really active cough. Like this is a really irritating um, sort of pneumonia that's uh, probably the granulomatous part of it being very different than kind of a bacterial that doesn't necessarily form those, form those granulomas. So you are more likely to get that active cough. And this is a kind of close-up pathology picture I stole from Jody, but here are your lungworms. If you can imagine, like these, this is lung tissue, which is really kind of crazy if you look at how many are packed in there and the a level of disease that you're talking about. Like this is a severe case. This was, was actually a post-anesthetic arrest case um, that had lungworm throughout the lungs. And I'll give you kind of the stats on that study as well. Um, but we're not talking about mild disease in some of these cats. We're talking about some pretty severe disease. So how do we treat it? Anybody remember? Ivermectin. ivermectin. So ivermectin is one way of treating. Um, there are some sources out there that say it's not as reliable as some others, but there's controversy about that. And there are people that defend that ivermectin works. Particularly for allurostrongulus, there's a little bit concerned that it might not be as effective as others. But absolutely, people use ivermectin and, and have success with it. Good. What else? Panicure, fenbendazole. If you're going to use fenbendazole, how long do you have to give it? 14 days, so a 14 day case of fenbendazole, um, which generally we give a liquid in cats, which generally is a challenge. Is that fair to say? For 14 days. But that has been our treatment method of choice until recently. So understanding that there were concerns with ivermectin being as effective as the fenbendazole. So fenbendazole 14 days, ivermectin once or once and repeat in two weeks. Any other treatments out there people are using? Okay, um, there is some information that in Europe, they're using moxidectin, which is essentially the equivalent of Advantage Multi. It is labeled for Allurostrongulus in Europe. It is, Advantage Multi is not labeled for Allurostrongulus here. However, Bowman and the companies are recommending it as an off-label usage, and we have been using it. Um, and I'll kind of give you some results on that with my N of one case that I'm gonna talk about. Um, but people are using Advantage Multi. As a preventive, we think it's really effective. 
So if you've got indoor outdoor cats, um, Advantage Multi should help prevent lungworm in those cats. And if you're giving it monthly, you should be able to hit the prepatent period. And I do think it is a concern for our indoor outdoor cats in this area in particular. Um, I've had quite a few students talk to me about their indoor out outdoor cats and their lungworm. My own cat is prone to getting lungworm because he eats snails and everything else that he can find, um, except he doesn't have teeth, so it has to be soft. So pretty much it's snails and slugs is what he kind of pulls out of things. Um, Profender is another one that they're using in Europe. It's a Profender equivalent product. That's not what it's named there. Um, it's an off-label usage, but it is reported by CAPSI and reported by Europe to be effective. So there's two more options that you might want to look at if you're struggling with your 14 days of fembendazole. Um, but truthfully, it's not labeled in the U.S. yet, and the studies are very limited. Yes? We do not. And in fact, there are papers out of Italy. If you really want to look at the um, use of products, Italy is a hotbed for lungworm and a hotbed for clinical trials on these products. Selamectin has been reported to be effective in one paper from Italy that I saw. So selamectin may be another option. All right. So this paper um, was written by Jody Gurdon, a pathologist who graduated. She was a classmate of mine. And she looked at, and some of you were actually involved in this study, I'm sure. Um, she looked at 54 cats from high-quality, high-volume spay-neuter programs from two different sources. One was a local spay-neuter program, and the other was ASPCA spay-neuter program down in New York City. And she simply did necropsies on 54 cats to see if she could determine the cause of death um, from post-anesthetic arrest. 24%, one quarter of those cats had pulmonary disease. And the reason she did this, kind of her hypothesis was, we usually say, oh, they must have had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They went into cardiac arrest because they had undetected heart disease. And that's a lot of times what we say in these post-anesthetic arrests. And particularly if you're in high volume and you're doing high volumes of numbers, you're not necessarily getting necropsies on those, all those animals or in a shelter setting. A quarter of them had pulmonary disease. 9% of them had allurostrongulus. So five of the 54 um, had allurostrongulus. And some pretty significant disease, including the one that I showed you, which I have to go back, that one. Cat came in, you know, again, a lot of times we don't necessarily have a background on it, no reports of coughing and that sort of thing, but that was what the cat's lungs looked like on necropsy. 11% of them did have heart disease, undetected heart disease. 4% had surgical complications, and 63% of them had signs of no gross disease. So it's really hard to comment on prevalence or how important this finding is, except that it was the top parasitic reason, and it's certainly enough to give us pause especially if you are looking at the level of disease that those worms were call it, causing in the heart. Because we used to be like, oh, it's lungworm, they cough it up, you know, it's, it doesn't really cause a problem. Obviously, it does cause a problem if there's that level of pathology when we find it in some of these cats. Um, again, there may be other factors, complicating risk factors. It was not broken down that way. But I do think that this made us all pause and say, wait a minute. Certainly in our shelter, it made us pause and say, if we've got a diagnosed case of lungworm, are we really taking that animal to anesthesia now, or are we going to wait till after it's 14 days of fembendazole, or it's ivermectin treatments, or et cetera? OK, and I'm going to come back to that. So I'm going to come back to lungworm, but I wanted to cover one other really interesting, one of my favorite parasites to talk about. And I talked about this at the conference two years ago. I think I did a toxoplasmosis lecture. So some of you may have heard that. This is an abbreviated little version. But just to remind you that toxoplasmosis can be a respiratory pathogen and a cause for pneumonia. So the cat is also the definitive host there. Um, and we have our lovely little side rodent and bird um, transport host. But the cat is truly the definitive host for toxoplasma. And they are the ones who shed the eggs based on that. So they will shed the oocytes. Um, the shedding period is 14 days. And those oocytes are not, um, oocysts are not infective immediately. So in terms of shelter control of this disease, we always talk about making sure you clean the litter boxes daily or dump litter boxes, use cardboard litter boxes, et cetera, if toxoplasma is a problem in your area, which it's a problem in a lot of areas. Prevalence um, for serology, depending on your area, can be 30 40% and as high as 60% in some areas in these cats. How do they get it? They ingest the tissue cysts, so they ingest them in the rodents or in the, um, in the birds, and they can get it that way. They can get it fecal oral by getting sporulated um, cysts. Or, and this is really the part I'm going to focus on, transplacental. Remember that kittens can essentially get it in utero from their mothers. And that's often when we actually see cases of toxoplasmosis are in our kittens. Um, and that's when we see them as pneumonias. 
So the clinical signs are nonspecific, anorexia, fever, lethargy, and toxo can affect multiple systems, remembering myocytes, so you can see cardiac disease from toxo. Neurologic is what I t always tended to think about. So when I learned toxo um, in vet school, I thought about it as a neurological agent, um, and if I had a neurological cat to go looking for toxo. Ophthalmic is a big one. So 80% will have ophthalmic lesions with toxo, but the most common presentation is respiratory. So it looks like pneumonia because it is. It's toxoplasma-based pneumonia. And similar to some of the pictures that you look at with allerostrongulus, it's significant. So this is a picture of lung tissue from a cat, um, and it was a case report of a cat um, that had toxoplasma-based pneumonia um, with large cysts. And this is an interstitial pneumonia, but large cysts throughout those lung tissues. So you can imagine that that could impact um, and cause pneumonia in these cases. It's an inflammatory process, so again, you're looking at exudate into your walls. It's a type 1, type 2 pneumocyte, so this is more of an alveolar pattern. Rather than getting kind of your big granulomas, you tend to get more of an interstitial alveolar pattern of disease. But it's also a systemic disease. So you'll see the respiratory along with hepatic, myositis, neurologic signs, cardiac signs. But sometimes what you are really going to see initially is that respiratory pattern. And I really want you to remember to think about this with your young animals, your kittens um, and your adolescents when you see the pneumonia. And don't just assume it's a secondary pneumonia or they just have a bad upper respiratory because it may very well be toxoplasmosis that you're looking at. Um, if they're shedding oocytes, it's usually in fecal samples. So sometimes we get our diagnosis of toxo in our kittens on fecals because we send a lot of fecals or look at a lot of fecals from our kittens with diarrhea. Toxo in itself shouldn't really cause diarrhea. Most of the time, if they're having diarrhea and shedding toxo, they've got another reason for the diarrhea, but catching the toxo at that point is kind of key. Because the shedding comes first, that's the acute illness, you only shed for up to 14 days, and then essentially if you remain infected and you don't clear that, then you're going to develop all the other syndromes, the myositis, um, the, the neurologic signs, and the respiratory. If you have those signs, you're probably no longer shedding. You've probably already cleared that, but this is a way to catch it. Serology on ill animals, you do antibody titers. The serology doesn't help you um, to know if they're actively shedding. They're two different things. The serology tells you that the animal was at one point infected. And sometimes that can help you decide if it's acute or chronic. Is it actually playing a role in what I'm seeing right now? So IgM is your earlier titer, if you're remembering. IgG is your later titer. I'm sure you all remember this. And that they can remain toxoplasma um, positive on serology for life. So that does not indicate that it's an active infection. Um, but if they're serology positive, I just wanted to remind everybody, that makes them very low risk. That doesn't mean they're going to shed. They're not zoonotic at that point. Their only time when they really can infect you is when they are sh actively shedding in that 14-day window of acute infection. Um, as an aside, there's a little bit of controversy of whether cats can shed repeatedly over their lives with additional stresses or immune compromise. There's active research in that. But what we've usually always believed is that you only shed once and then you remain seropositive. There are some questions now that with cats on chemo and as we pursue start, start pursuing more advanced treatments that we may actually inact, we may reactivate that in some of our cats. But we're not talking about that in the shelter setting. So I'll go back to shelter. With toxoplasmosis pneumonia, the, pro, the prognosis is really guarded. Um, and so if that's what you've got, especially in a younger animal, immune compromised animal, the prognosis is definitely guarded because it causes severe disease. I mean, this is, this is um, an example of a, gross picture from a toxoplasma pneumonia case from Tufts. Um, they do respond to therapy. Your, respond, your choice for drug there is clindamycin, 25 to 50, 50 mg per kg, so it's a high dose, um, until one week after the clinical signs resolve. Um, again, you generally see this in immune compromised patients or in transplacental infections in kittens. And their prognosis in the shelter, if they're demonstrating the pneumonia, the neurologic signs, myositis, is pretty low. Their prognosis, even not in the shelter, is, is pretty poor. Um, but you certainly can try treatment. It doesn't clear the organism, so it's important to know that even if they get better, they will still have organisms insisted in their tissues, um, which may or may not become an issue later on in their lives. So, talking about kittens, I've always thought of, when I would think about our fading kittens, I've usually talked about panleukopenia, and that's what we all kind of talk about. You've got fading kittens, you've got kittens dying, we're doing parvo tests on them, we're necropsying them for panleukopenia. But we've actually been involved in a study um, funded through the Feline Health Center. It's a small study. 
looking at the necropsies of our fading kittens. Um, so the kittens that have either died suddenly, acutely, or kittens that we've euthanized over after a prolonged treatment course and they're not doing well. So we've been submitting those for necropsy and we've actually found some surprising signs is that panleukopenia actually was less frequent than toxoplasmosis. So it's a small number, it's still in its early stages. I think last year we had 14 kittens that went in. Five of those were toxoplasmosis as, as essentially the cause of death because the tissues were so infected. Um, and so it really has made me pause as I'm looking at the kittens that are in our upper respiratory ward, kittens that are not doing well, um, or the ones that do develop pneumonia. Um, certainly we're sending fecals and we look to recover that, but remember we may not get a positive fecal on a toxoplasma kitten if it's progressed to the point where it's systemic. Um, it does give you a reason to look at fecals um, and remind, kind of remind yourself that you want to be looking for those toxoplasma oocysts, which are super, super small. And you don't want to confuse them with coccidia, which if you're not well trained at looking at that, you can do. They can look a little bit like coccidia on a fecal. So if you're doing in-house fecals, you kind of want to go back and refresh your, yourself because you may find that you're going to catch more toxins than you suspected. Um, so I've added it to my list, certainly, from, for fading kitten syndrome is to look for something like toxoplasma pneumonia. We've also had, like I said, a fair number of lungworm pneumonias. Those tend to be our adolescent cats. So remember, you have to pick it up from that peritonic host. And so that means they're out, they're hunting. That's not your kittens. Those tend to be your active adolescents that are kind of patrolling the streets and picking up slimy things to eat. So clinical signs in cats to review. They can be very subtle. They, their respiratory distress can vary. They may only have a fever half the time, so don't use that to decide if you think it's progressing. They generally will have a cough, especially if it's Bordetella or some of our sexy parasites like lungworms. Um, the tachycardia is usually secondary to hypoxia, sepsis, fever, or progression of disease. Uh, and crackles and wheezes on auscultation are really important um, to focus on and to kind of train your staff and make sure people are listening to these cats on a regular basis. This was a survey that I did um, for a webinar, and so it's a national survey of 118 organizations to kind of figure out how medical care was provided for fostered animals. In particular, we were talking about kittens and that sort of thing, but it was a general question. And I put it up there, I used it earlier um, in the Parvo lecture too, because what came out of that is about a third of the organizations had a staff veterinarian that was providing care for their fostered animals. 64% um, of them were using private practices. And obviously this doesn't all add up because there's all these other categories, so it's a little bit of a mix. But it's my slide to remember to say that if you're going to treat um, something as severe as pneumonia or some of these fading cases, you really want to do it to a standard of care that recognizes their welfare. And so whether that's going out into the private practice, whether it's in foster care with veterinary support, whether it's in your shelter with veterinary support, we want to be real sure that we've got a system set up to support them to the adequate, so they have an adequate quality of life during their treatment, because treating pneumonia is going to be a prolonged course for them. So we want to make sure that, that they're not suffering in that course. And I put this up too, some of you have already seen it this morning. I always think of this with these illnesses, I want to think about what is the prognostic indicator not all of the cases, even if we do identify what the organism is, may be able to be treated effectively in our shelters. It really depends. And that means we may need to send them out to private practice or we may need to come up with a different plan with a special foster. Um, but you want to look at the severity of their illness, concurrent illness, their signalmen, how, how old are they, um, are they a kitten, are they compromised in other ways, do they have retroviruses, do they have other systemic signs, do we have um, an animal that's really already suffering in our care, and where antibiotics may or may not make the difference. And part of that is recognizing your, the ability of your organization to treat and the adaptability of the patient. So this one's hard to read right there, but that says people. And I always kind of come back to the idea that as veterinarians, we were trained to put the animal at the center of all of our decisions. And inherently, we already do that. We do it every time, I think, as veterinarians. Our goal is to always fix the patient. But we have to remember, especially if we're working in a shelter, that we're also looking at an organization and we're looking at the people that surround us and all of the things that come with them. And our decisions are always a conglomerate of these three things. The medicine is a, an, is a small part of it. The animal is our automatic focus, but we really have to look at what do we need to do as an organization? What people do I need to have in place? What training do they need? What kind of funds do I need to have in order to be able to provide this to the care that these animals need? because I don't think it's fair to ask them to sign on for prolonged treatment if it's not up to a standard that alleviates their suffering while we're doing it.
And so it just means having a plan and being able to recognize that pneumonia. Because I think a lot of times we may not recognize it because we're treating upper respiratory disease. We get lucky if the antibiotics that we're given treat the pneumonia and everything's fine. But remember, going back to the quote in the beginning, that pneumonia may reflect that there's other risk factors at play and it's up to us to be investigative and realize what those are and then see if we can support those as well. Quick five freedoms, I'm sure you've all seen it a million times, but I threw it in there because for me it's always a part of deciding on selecting a patient for treatment and whether I think that we can do them justice in that. So, want to talk about an interesting case? Ready to see an animal? Because that's really why we all came here. Okay, so let's talk about Gilda. Gilda is estimated to be a four-year-old female stray who was brought into our shelter. I'm not showing you the picture yet on purpose. Body condition score is three out of nine. Danny, are you here? Yeah, Danny, no giving away anything. Body condition score, three out of nine. We vaccinated and dewormed her at intake. So our protocol was FBRCP um, and a rabies at intake, drontal at intake, FELV, FIV negative, tested at intake. And then she came in and somebody reports her to be coughing. And one of the staff members like, she's coughing and she looks kind of funky. There's something funky about her. Oop, oh, I just gave you it in the wrong order. But anybody see anything funky? Eyelids, what's that called? You can think about it for a minute. Okay, so eyelids are up. So our differentials for coughing in our shelter, and I went, actually went back through the paper records um, and kind of to try and look at the order of how all this happened. So yep, coughing, again, in our shelter is lungworm till proven otherwise. It certainly could be um, bronchitis, it could be asthma, it could be bordetella, it could be toxoplasmosis, it could be cancer. But it's always lungworm first if we don't have any other indicators in our shelter. So somebody's like, yep, she's coughing, differentials are lungworm, but it could be all these other things. Um, so we're going to start her on fenbendazole for 14 days, and we're going to see how things go. Oh, by the way, her eyes look funny. What's up with her eyes? She looks really sleepy. Let's get closer. Anybody remember what it's called? Haws, good. Haws. What causes Haws syndrome, which is essentially the elevation of both third eyelids? Who knows the magic? What causes it? So it's kind of like Horner's syndrome, but it's bilateral, and you don't necessarily get meiosis or ptosis. So you don't necessarily get the other factors. You tend to just get the third eyelids up. But what's the innervation in Horner's syndrome? Where do we look? We look in the inner ear, right? So we look in the inner ear, and where else do we look if you've got Horner's? You're going to look thoracic, cranial thoracic. So you're going to look, because remember, sympathetic trunk comes down, it kind of runs up through there, and you can have a thoracic mass that causes Horner syndrome. It's not always your inner ear. When you have Haas syndrome, if you look in the literature, it's rumored to be caused by tapeworms. And I can't find the primary source for that, but everything you look at is like, well, it's thought it might be caused by tapeworms. Because somebody somewhere along the line found tapeworms and Haas, and it very well may be based on what I'm about to show you. But so, but I was always like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, I was with Dr. Delahunta. Like, I need to know neurologically why these eyelids are up. It also reminded me of a very embarrassing moment when I, before I was a vet student, when I was working as a um, med assistant in a practice, and a cat with haws came in, and me being like the first year, you know, it's my first year working in a practice, and I'm the little person who puts them in the room, and I was made like, oh, it's cherry eye. No problem, it's surgically fixable. And the vet was like, don't you ever do that again. It is not cherry eye, it is not surgically fixable. And I was like, so I never forgot Haas because it was super embarrassing that I just kind of jumped ahead and said something to a client like an idiot um, and was quickly shut down on that. So I, I haven't forgotten it. But Haas syndrome, there is a thought that it's also, you always want to check the thorax. So they don't really know what causes it. Tapeworms are on the list. A GI disease, GI inflammation. Again, I wouldn't know the mechanism and nobody else seems to know it either. Um, but I do caution you to always kind of check the thorax. And so when we diagnose lungworms in this cat or presumptive lungworms, and then a fecal did go out and I'll show you that. Um, I was also like, mm, you know, because coughing cat, fine. You know, we can do that. We'll look in the feces. But this bothers me. I want a chest rat on this cat. Um, and so Dr. Bose was graceful enough to figure that out and, and not think I was totally crazy. We did run blood work, and I will tell you that's because um, we are connected to the college, and so we tend to get a little bit more blood work than most shelters. I only put the abnormalities on here, but do note, hematocrit 33, everything was fine, but white blood cell count was up. Um, that was a combination of SEGS and a little bit of band um, influence, but note the eosinophils, normal. 
So eosinophils are normal. White blood cells are count up with neutrophils and bands. So right now, what are you thinking? What would be the natural thing? Could be bacterial, maybe something else. I'd like to see some eosinophils. If I saw eosinophils, I'd feel a little bit better that it would be longworm. But truly, it's probably not helping me, which isn't surprising, because sometimes it doesn't. CBC, not necessarily helpful. Chemistry, the only thing that I noted was total protein was up at 8.5 albumin at 3, and globulin at 5.5. Does that help us at all? Any added differentials? FIP. Yeah, at this point, I would say it wouldn't be crazy to remember FIP and that there could be a problem and add that to our differentials. So worthwhile. So now our addition is probably FIP. We sent out a fecal. This is, this is a snapshot of what the exact paper we got back. Okay. So Giardia, um, Allurostrongulus, and Cyclostoma, Tubiforme, I don't even know what that is, Toxicara, uh, Capillaria, which is lungworm as well, and a second Capillaria, which is also lungworm. Um, the note being, this sample contains a very high number of Giardia cysts and Allurostrongulus larvae. And they were like, this is a party. This cat is having a party in its colon and in its lungs. Um, and so we kind of went back through and said, okay, what do we have it on? We have it on fenbendazole. Oh, good, we've covered our Giardia. We have it on, you know, fenbendazole. We've covered the other capillaria as well. Um, we've covered our Toxicara because we gave it adronal at the time. So we're, we're covered with, with Gilda, but boy, does she have, did she bring some friends to this party, okay? And then we were still like, eh, maybe some chest rads would be indicated. Pre-treatment, we had just started, I shouldn't say pre-treatment, we had started our fenbendazole at this point. This was November 26th. So, differentials, pneumonia, anything else? Neoplasia. Neoplasia, yeah. And if you've ever sent a radiograph to the imaging department at Cornell, because we do our images over at Cornell, they're never going to call just pneumonia. So it was, pneumonia could be cancer. Could be cancer, can't rule out cancer, maybe cancer. But we're going to hope <laughs> it's lungworm pneumonia. But it could be cancer. So we're like, okay, great. You want to see the lateral? Yeah, right? Um, not pretty. So how quickly are the RADs going to change with treatment? I see some head shaking. They tend to be delayed, right? So your RADs don't improve as well as your cat. So a lot of times you really have to base this on clinical signs. So we decided to treat her. We put her on fenbendazole. We actually gave her Advantage Multi 2. We did both. Um, we took her back in uh, three weeks later, and she's clinically better. She's not coughing as much, although she's still coughing in her infrequently. Um, she had gone into foster with a student. Suzanne, are you here? She was in foster with a vet student who brought her back and is like, no, no, she seems better. She's bright. She's eating. But there's still some, a little bit of coughing. And this was her chest rad three weeks later. So differentials? Neoplasia. Could be cancer, right? We're hoping it's scarring and some response to lungworm. And what I learned in this process is actually your RADs in treating parasitic pneumonia, your RADs can get worse before they get better. Because as you're killing off the lungworms, you're actually, those granulomas may actually get worse. So your RADs may look worse. Well, that was great for us to know, but yes, could be cancer. Oh, by the way, this could be cancer. <laughs> but the cat was clinically doing better, although how she was breathing with that, I don't know. Surprisingly, after that rad, we were like, well, she's clinically better. We're going to have to spay her at some point. We got to figure this out. And we decided we're going to do a trachea wash to see what we recover because that'll help us feel better about is this cancer or not. And she's clinically more stable. We are in a shelter. We do tend to anesthetize animals that are sometimes ill. And we felt pretty good about this. At least I did. Um, although it was a stressful one, I will tell you that. And Dr. Bose, were you there for that that day? OK. It was a little bit stressful. She did turn a little blue. But we retrieved a really good sample. And we needed to know, is this cancer or is this not? What are we going to do with this kitty? And in fact, on her tracheal wash, she had live lungworms still swimming around, in spite of her Advantage Multi and her 14 days of fenbendazole. So we still had active live larvae. So whether it was the level of infection that she had, whether it was um, problems with penetration, with the illness, whether it was the fact that she was so parasite, you know, loaded with parasites that she wasn't as responsive, but we still recovered swimming larvae. So now what? More fenbendazole and more Advantage Multi and maybe a little ivermectin thrown in too. I think we threw the whole book at her.
Um, Panicure Advantage Multi, again, repeat treatment. She clinically improved. We thought about taking her back for RADS at that point. We're like, eh, we take her back for RADS, they're probably still going to look bad. She was doing really well. We were able to spay her. We cleared her for adoption in February, and we sent her out with a big, long memo that this cat has survived the worst case of parasitic pneumonia we have seen. She's clinically doing well. She may have issues. We'd ha be happy to hear from you. We can see her back um, if you're concerned. And somebody adopted her. And then a week after they adopted her, they called because they went to the local veterinarian who noticed that she had a little chip fracture in her tooth, and they wanted to bring her back in for us to do a dental procedure on her. <laughs> At which point, I almost lost my mind and cried. So if you're that vet who sent her back, I apologize. But you sent me into a tizzy. Because <laughs> the last thing I wanted to do right now was re this cat. Because actually, when we did the tracheal wash, she did have some issues. She did turn a little bit blue. They can be scary, but they, it, again, it's saline, it absorbs, and it was fine. And we did get a really good sample, which actually helped us say, no, this is not cancer, so that we could move forward with this patient. So what do you think I did at this point? I said. That's very sweet. We'd love to see her back. We can evaluate her tooth, but not until June. We will see her in six months. When, how is she doing? She's doing great. She coughing? No. She active? Yes. She runs all over the house. We'll see her back in six months. We'll evaluate the tooth at that point, and we'll see whether we can put her under. But I am not comfortable putting her under anesthesia right now, knowing what her lungs looked like just a couple weeks ago. And so true to, true to form, in June, we, she came back in for a recheck. Um, we took over for chest rads before anesthetizing her for a dental procedure, and there's her chest. I would like you to note this. What is this? Fat. The cat had gained five pounds. <laughs> so she wasn't that active, obviously. That's just her fat pad. But her chest was nice and clear. Um, so at that point, she was able to have that extraction. So we did extract her tooth. She did really well. This is truly her owner. He was the sweetest guy. He loved this cat, and she loved him back. Um, and so it ended up being a really happy story. But you can imagine a cat with that severe disease. That was a really prolonged course of treatment. The way we were able to do it is to find a sucker vet student to take her into foster. <laughs> so we, were, we took a couple risks in collecting samples. Um, we were able to do chest radiographs because we had access to them, um, and, and we took a chance. It was a gamble, but it was one that paid off um, for this kitty and for us because it was a great learning opportunity and certainly the worst case of parasitic pneumonia I've seen. But again, they are out there, especially if you're regional. Uh, lungworm should be on your differential. Preventive treatment with Advantage Multi, not a bad idea. Um, and you do want to think about it with your anesthetic patients. We changed our protocol on coughing cats and lungworm positive cats, um, where we do delay their surgeries now until at least we get a little bit of sense of how they're doing and we get some treatment on board. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for hanging in there with me. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them.